And uh, we are going to be looking, continuing on Beholding Our God. Last night we looked at Behold Our Sovereign God, and we looked at those 16 characteristics of our wonderful God and how we already respond to him. Then secondly, we looked at Behold Our God, Behold How He Loved. He loved them to the end. And ladies, he loves us to the end too. And I hope that was encouraging to you. He even loved Judas, uh, who betrayed him. I think of the rich young ruler and you know, he wasn't willing to give up all that he had. And it says when he went away sorrowful that Jesus looked on him and he loved him. He loved him. And so that let that sink into your heart, especially during those times where you feel unloved or rejected. Remember, God loves you, okay? So now we're going to behold our God by looking at his humility. And that is a lost virtue in our culture, isn't it? It's really hard uh, today to find people that are humble, uh, I don't know very many people that are humble, um, and I think the most humblest person probably doesn't even know they're humble. But uh, we live in a narcissistic culture where it's all about us. Uh, you, if you are on social media at all, you realize, even among the Christian world, we have people that are constantly posting pictures of themselves, how great they are, how wonderful they are, what they've done. Uh, they think they have all the right answers. We see very little humility among believers and ladies that grieves my heart and my husband used to say the two twin pillars of the church are love and humility and ladies if you don't have love and you don't have humility I would I would encourage you examine yourself because that is the example that Christ set for us and so we're going to look this morning behold our humble God so if you would turn in your Bibles to Philippians Philippians chapter 2 and we are going to look at verses 5 through 8. Now, before I give the introduction to this lesson, I don't want you to go away here saying, you know, Susan thinks that God speaks audibly to us or anything like that. Or, uh, but I do want to give an illustration because I want you to think as I mention this way of introduction. Let's suppose that tomorrow morning when you get up, you begin your day with prayer. I hope you do. And as you're praying, the Lord audibly speaks to you and tells you that this is going to be your last day on planet Earth as you know it. He has a mission for you. You are no longer going to enjoy the benefits of being a wife, a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, a sister, or a single woman. Now I hope none of you are saying, good deal. I was wondering how I could get out of that role. <laughs> I'm assuming you love your role as a woman and you don't want to give it up very readily. But this mission from the Lord, he says, it's going to mean you'll no longer have your surroundings as you know them. Your family will not be around you, your home, your church, your town, your state, not even your country. The Lord tells you that he's asking you to leave everything and to leave it willingly because he has another job for you to do. You're going to go to a place where you're going to be separated from everything and everyone that you know. You're also going to live among people that are totally foreign to you and they hate you. You're going to suffer. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be hated and some of your best friends are going to forsake you. And at the end of this mission that you are going to take, you're going to suffer excruciating pain on a cross and you're going to die for those people that hate you. Does that sound like an assignment that you would want to undertake? <laughs> Would you do it? If the Lord asks you, would you humble yourself and go, leaving all the comforts of this life and obey this call? Jesus did. Jesus did. And ladies, he's our model example of humility, the lost virtue in our Christian world today. And according to what the Apostle Paul writes, you and I are to have the same mind. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. Let's listen in as we read Philippians 2, 5 to 8. I just quoted verse 5. Uh, I think I just quoted it all, so sorry about that. I was going to look down at it, and, and here we go. So those are the verses we're going to look at. If you know anything about the epistle to the Philippians, Paul is writing from prison. It's a prison epistle. 
uh, it's one of many that he wrote. Uh, he is in a place that's not very exciting. It's not like our prisons here that we have in the United States of America, where you can have a computer, you can go to the canteen and get candy bars, you can even work out, you can have a job and make money. It's a dark place where Paul is. He's chained to two soldiers. Uh, there's cramped quarters, it smells because there's no toilets. Uh, male and female prisoners are incarcerated together, so there's a lot of sexual immorality going on. Uh, there's very little food, very little water, and yet Paul says he's rejoicing. Sixteen times he says, I'm rejoicing, be joyful, be glad. I'm not anxious for anything. I'm content in whatever state I am, whether I'm hungry, whether I'm full, whether I have everything, whether I have nothing. He says, I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. So ladies, keep this in mind as we read these verses from Paul. In fact, it was so bad where he was that most prisoners asked for a speedy death and others just simply committed suicide. It was that bad. And yet, he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote this wonderful epistle for us. And he talks about here in this passage about the appeal to us to be humble. And ladies, he was in humble circumstances. But we are to be humble as our Lord Jesus Christ. These verses that we're going to be covering are some of the most majestic verses of the person of Christ. And I hope as we study this this morning, I hope you will be humbled, humbled, ladies, at the love of the Lord and giving himself for you. You should be humbled at that. You shouldn't be prideful. You should be humbled. And it should cause humility in every one of us. We're unworthy of that love. So you have an outline there before you. We're going to look at the depth of Christ's humility as seen in his relationship to God in verses 5 and 6. And then the depth of Christ's humility as seen in his relationship to man, verses 7 and 8. So let's look at the humility of our Lord as seen in his relationship with his Father, with God. Look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. The word mind, your translation might say attitude. We are to have the same attitude as the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does this mean? Ladies, this means we are to have the same goals as he had. We are to have the same mindset. We would want to make the same decisions. And Paul says your mind or your attitude should be the same as Jesus Christ. So what would this mean? Forget yourself. Forget yourself. Don't even think about yourself. Have a deep concern for others. Ladies, the Lord's attitude was seen in humility. That is what we see. Look at verse 6. It tells us how it was seen in his relationship to God. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now when Paul mentions that uh, the form of God here, it has nothing to do with God's physical shape or his size. The word form means the outward expression of an inward nature. Ladies, what this means is in eternity past, Jesus Christ was God. Jesus Christ was God, has always continued to be God by nature. He is the express image of his Father, of God. Now, by the way, some cults deny this important fact when talking about Christ. And I would encourage you when debating those cults, uh, use this verse. Use John 1, 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, uh, which combat their terrible heresy. They don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe that Jesus came in the form of a man. And Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, they all hold to that. Uh, some even Word of Faith people now, New Apostolic Reformation, uh, some of those hold to that. And so when you're talking to people like that, ladies, you need to take them back to the scriptures. The Word of God is our plumb line for everything. And so, ladies, what is Paul saying here? He's saying to us, to the church at Philippi, Jesus Christ was the very essence of God in his incarnation. When he came to earth, he embraced perfect humanity. And Paul says, even though he was God in the flesh, notice what he says, Jesus did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The word robbery here means to seize with force, to, to clutch greedily, to, to prize highly. Ladies, the meaning is the Lord did not esteem being equal with God as 
identical with the coming forth of an action of a robber. And you know what a robber does, a thief does, right? They steal greedily and quickly. I remember uh, in my husband's first church, and we'd gone out to run an errand, and we weren't gone very long. And we came back, and someone had broken in to the back of our house, stole my wedding rings. I got new ones out of that, but uh, anyway, so that was a good deal. But um, anyway, they stole our wedding rings. There was blood everywhere, and I mean, they, we hadn't been gone that long. And I'm thinking, how in the world did someone break in our home that fast and steal all that stuff? That's what thieves do, right? They do their work, and they do it pretty quickly. What is Paul saying here? Jesus Christ did not, did not grab that equality with God. He didn't consider his equality with God as something selfishly to be handled, hold on to, like that robber does, that thief that breaks into your house and steals your stuff, and they, they get out quick. He didn't regard it as a prize, a treasure to be clutched to, onto. Ladies, his equality with God was not a thing to be anxiously retained. Instead, it was an occasion for him to renounce every advantage and every privilege he had. He gave it all up. He gave it all up to come to the earth to die for our sins. Boy, what a contrast to Satan. Have you ever considered the contrast between God, who's humble, Jesus, who's humble, and Satan, who's prideful? Listen to Isaiah 14, 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, you son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? You've said in your heart, I'll ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Wow. <laughs> that sounds like some in our day, right? In fact, the psalmist says in Psalm 14, 1, often misinterpreted scripture, the fool has said in his heart, not there is no God. That's not what he says. He says, no, God. No. That's the literal Hebrew translation. No. I'm my own God. Ladies, that's not the, the posture of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was humble. He was humble. Satan considered being equal with God as something to be grasped. He wanted to clutch it like a robber, like a thief. But we know Lady Satan is going to pay a high price for his attempted robbery of God's equality, isn't he? Aren't you glad that he's going to pay a high price for it? I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of sick of him. You know, uh, he, uh, He's always lurking, seek, seeking who he can devour, right? And he wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. But you know what? One day we're not going to have to battle anymore with the enemy. Listen to Isaiah 14, 15. Yet you will be brought down to hell, to the lowest parts of the pit. <laughs> Ladies, one day Satan and all his cohorts are going to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And I say, hallelujah, right? Ladies, think about the contrast. Think about your own life. It is better for you and me and the Philippian believers to have the mindset of Christ instead of the mindset of Satan. Ladies, Christ did not hesitate to set aside his self-willed use of deity when he became a man. And you know, as Jesus, as God in the flesh, he had every right to do so. But he laid it aside. Why? Because he thought of others. He thought of others as more important than himself. And ladies, we're to have that same mindset. In fact, we shouldn't even be thinking of ourselves at all. And I know we have to get up and we have to get dressed and we have to, you know, get ready for the day and brush our teeth and... You know, hopefully you don't smell too bad. We have to think of ourselves, you know. But isn't that an interesting passage that we're to love our neighbor as we already do ourselves? I don't doubt any in this room love their neighbor as much as you do yourself because we're lovers of ourselves, right? In fact, we know that's one of the signs of the last age. Men are going to be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. That's where we are. Ladies, Jesus didn't think of himself in any way at all. That's the mind of Christ. And that's the attitude that says, I'm not going to keep my privileges for myself. I will use them for others. I will lay them aside no matter what I have to do. Ladies, most of us, most of us hold tightly to things that puff up our ego, right? Like our good works, our spirituality, our family, all our accomplishments, our vocations. But not Jesus. He gave it all up. 
He gave it all up. Paul goes on to say he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This phrase means one who sustains the same rank, the same size, the same equality. Ladies, Jesus was equal with God in nature and rank, and yet he humbled himself and became a man. So if you're taking notes, we see the depth of our Lord's humility and his relationship to God. How was it manifested? By letting go of his equality with God. He let it go. He didn't grab it. He let it go. Ladies, in everything, he let it go. Why? To become a man. To become a man. And just when you think, whoa, that's humility, we see his humility go a little bit deeper as we consider the depth of Christ's humility as seen in his relationship to men, to us, to me, to you. Look at verse 7 and 8. He made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Ladies, our Lord's humility is seen in this when we see what Paul is saying. He made himself of no reputation. The Greek here means he made himself empty. He made himself void. He was willing to be despised. He was willing to be discarded for the sake of man. Now, ladies, this doesn't mean that Christ emptied himself of his deity. He couldn't cease to be God. So when, when Paul says he emptied himself, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, there are three areas, according to the scriptures, that Christ emptied himself of to become a man, to die for your sins. Ladies, number one, the first way Christ emptied himself was of his riches. We don't know what heaven is like. Eye has not seen nor ears heard what God's prepared for those who love him. If you read Revelation 21 and 22 and you look at the descriptions of heaven, you go, whoa, <laughs> whoa. But for your sake, he became poor. He became poor. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might be made rich. Ladies, Christ left the splendor, the glory, the riches of heaven to come to earth. In fact, you know he was so poor, he had to borrow a place for his birth a house to sleep in, a boat to preach from, an animal to ride on, a room in which to institute the Lord's Supper as we looked at last night, and finally a tomb to be buried in. It was all borrowed. <laughs> he didn't own anything, right? The second way in which he emptied himself was he gave up his heavenly glory. He gave up his glory. In fact, in the high priestly prayer, John 17, one of my most favorite portions of scripture, before Jesus goes to the cross, he says, And now, O oh Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. I gave it up. I gave up my glory to die for these people. And now, Lord, restore that glory. Ladies, he gave up his riches. He gave up his glory. And not only that, but thirdly, he gave up his independent exercise of authority. He gave up his authority. <laughs> Hebrews 5, 8 says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He gave up his authority. Think about it. He was no longer giving orders. He's now taking orders. He's taking orders. Do you know Jesus obeyed the law perfectly? Galatians 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Why? So that we might receive the adoption of sons. He also obeyed his parents. He obeyed his parents. <laughs> Remember Luke chapter 2, his parents had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and they're heading home, and they turn around, and Jesus isn't there. And his mother, finally, they catch up with him. And he said, Son, don't you know we've been worried about you? And he turned to his mother, not disrespectfully, he says, you know, mom, mother, I've got to be about the, the father's business. But, you know, right after that, it says he, he went home with them and he became subject to them. Jesus obeyed his parents. <laughs> he also obeyed the government. He said, what? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And he obeyed his father. He says, whatever my father tells me, that I do. Ladies, I, why do I bring this out? If you want to be humble, obey those in authority over you. We have a hard time with that, don't we? And I'm speaking, you know, I'm speaking from experience. 
We all have that little rebel in us. You know, my husband used to say before I became a believer, he was going to put on my headstone, she did it her way. So that kind of tells you what kind of wife I was, you know. No one was going to tell me what to do, especially a husband. But we have problems with authority, right? We don't like anyone telling us what to do. Our husband, our church leaders, our government, we want to do things our way. So ladies, we see from these three passages, Christ emptied himself of his riches, his glory, his independent exercise of authority. And Paul says, Jesus laid aside the form of God and he took upon him the form of a servant. Ladies, he exchanged the form of God for the form of a slave, a bond servant. This is someone who's in a relationship of servitude to another. A slave in the biblical world, his will or her will was altogether consumed in the will of his master. Ladies, is that you this morning? Is your will all consuming in the will of Christ? That's humility. That is humility. Ladies, Jesus stooped from sovereignty to slavery, from the sovereign of all to the servant of all. What a contrast to mankind. We demand our way, our rights. We don't want to submit to husbands, parents, teachers, elders, government, or even God. No God. No, God, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And yet Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're to have the same mindset, right? Give it all up. Give it all up for the sake of Christ. Ladies, we want to impress others. We want to manipulate others. We want to control others. We want to strive for our reputation, but not our sovereign God, not our sovereign Lord. He didn't want to impress anyone. He didn't want to be the boss. He didn't want to fight for his reputation. He wanted to be a slave. He wanted to be a slave. Do you want to be a slave? Matthew 20, 28 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In fact, I think one of the most humbling things we see our Lord doing is what we looked at last night. We didn't get to go into all the foot washing, but washing 24 dirty I mean, they didn't have manicures in those places. I mean, pedicures, you know? So can you imagine? I mean, I can't even imagine. But that's, that's humility, right? Humbling yourself to wash 24 dirty feet. We saw him take on the form of a servant in a real way. And so Paul goes on here in Philippians to say, he came in the likeness of man. What does that mean? He resembled man. He looked like us. He, was, he didn't look just like us. But he was a man. He had a body just like you and I do. And ladies, one day we're going to see him. Paul says this in Colossians, you know, that one day we will see him face to face. I mean, that's going to be, I don't know, I've wondered, you know, has my husband, I'm sure he has seen Jesus. He's been there two years now. And uh, I just can't even imagine what that's like to actually see Jesus. But one day we are going to see him. He has a body just like ours. He was made like man. He, he, he was still God in the flesh and yet he was made like us. Ladies, if that isn't enough humility for one lesson, we still have one more verse to look at as we close with a shocking example of our Lord's humility in relationship to man. Look at verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of a cross. And being found in, is translated, he discovered or learned what it meant to exist as a man. Now ladies, imagine. You don't know what it's like to have your new body. You don't even know what it's like to have no sin, right? Even though some people will tell you they have no sin. But John says, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, right? And the truth isn't in you. Jesus had never known what it was like to be a man. He didn't know what it was like, but he had an outward appearance that looked like a man. Ladies, he came into the world through the natural process just like you and I did. He grew up. He had brothers and sisters. He, had, he got hungry. He got tired. He had an occupation. He was a carpenter. He was weary. <laughs> he had to sleep. He grieved. He even got angry. He wept at times. He rejoiced. He attended weddings. He was found in fashion as a man, and yet he was God. And ladies, let this sink in, in your life. We have a great high priest who's been touched with the, the feelings of our infirmities. 
And we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. So ladies, when you're going through suffering, when you're going through difficult times, remember Jesus understands. He was a man. He knows you get hungry. He knows you get thirsty. He knows you get irritated. He, he knows all those things. Say, Lord, you know this. Help me. <laughs> Help me. You understand my infirmities. And so, ladies, because of that, we can come boldly to the throne of grace because he understands. He was just like us, and yet Paul says he humbled himself. The word humble here means to make low. He had a lowliness of mind. He emptied himself. Next, Paul says he became obedient. Obedient comes from the same Greek word in Ephesians 6, 1, where it says, children, obey your parents. <laughs> I wish they did. And ladies, I, I'm not asked to speak on parenting this weekend, but boy, I sure would like to. Because what I'm seeing in the Christian world is very disturbing to me. Uh, when I see uh, parents not parenting God's way. Ladies, parenting is not hard if you'll do it God's way. You want to do it your way? You're going to have a difficult time. But we need to do it God's way. Paul says children are to obey. The same Greek word that's used here in Philippians. That means to listen under. In other words, when you give an instruction to your child, they are to listen to what you say, and they are to obey the spoken word. First time obedience, right? Not delayed obedience. Delayed obedience is no obedience. And Elizabeth Elliot used to say they should not only obey the spoken word, but with a cheerful heart. Uh, that's the same Greek word used here. He, the Lord obeyed, and he did it with a cheerful heart. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of the Father. And ladies, we need to teach our children to obey us as parents. And so Paul says he became obedient. He listened under someone else's authority. Who? The Father. I came to do the Father's will. Ladies, being obedient means it happened in a moment of time. Jesus made the decision immediately, and there was no hesitation. I'm going to do it. Oh, that we would have the same mindset as Christ, no hesitation. Ladies, we put off obedience until it's convenient, but not our Lord. He willingly and wholeheartedly obeyed, and it cost him his life. He became obedient to the point of death, Paul says. Ladies, Christ came to earth to die. <laughs> It wasn't an accident. He came willingly. He grew up as a baby. He was a man, and he willingly went to the cross and suffered and died. Most of us in this room will obey the Lord if it doesn't cost us something, right? We don't want to suffer. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to be hated. Few of us will obey, even at the cost of suffering and in persecution. But how many of you will obey if it means your life? If you really thought that you might lose your life for the sake of Christ. Would you obey him? That's, ladies, that's something to think about. We're living in a culture now that hates Christians. For me personally, I've had more persecution in my own life in the last five, ten years than I ever can remember being a Christian. Even women wanting to beat me up, some of them trying to beat me up. Uh, wicked things said, and it's not going to just be verbal persecution. If we're going to stand for the truth of God's word, we're going to be hated. We're going to be hated. But how many of us would obey even to the point if it meant our life? Christ did. He obeyed even unto death. And ladies, it wasn't lethal injection. It wasn't instant electrocution. It wasn't sudden death of any kind. It was the death, notice what Paul says, of a cross. Of a cross. This means a stake for execution, an instrument of torture. Ladies, death by crucifixion was one of the most worst forms of dying. There was intense suffering, intense shame. In fact, crucifixion was reserved for criminals, not for our Savior. In fact, we know from Deuteronomy 21, anyone that hung on a tree was cursed. And no Roman citizen was ever crucified. It was only reserved for Rome's enemies. Ladies, I don't think we stop often to think about what our Lord went through because the Roman scourge was a most dreadful instrument of torture and suffering. It was made of tendons, of oxen, sharp bones were intertwisted among the tendons. So every time the lash came down on Jesus' back, pieces of bone inflicted fearful lacerations and literally tore off chunks of his flesh from his bones. That's not all he endured. He endured the, the nails in his hands, in his feet, the mocking, the ridicule. If you're the Christ, why don't you come down from the cross? <laughs> You saved others, can't you save yourself? I mean, can you imagine you're, you're hanging on a cross, you're bleeding, flesh is falling off, and 
Then you've got the people at the bottom of the cross mocking, scourging you. Isaiah says he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. We've been healed. We've been healed, ladies. Isaiah says it pleased the Father to bruise his son for us. Ladies, that's humility. (laughs) There's no better example of humility for us to follow than that of our Lord Jesus Christ, who exemplifies for us a selfless attitude. Surely if Christ Jesus humbled himself so deeply, we as women should be constantly willing to humble ourselves. Surely if he became obedient to the death of a cross, we should be obedient to his will in our lives. And ladies, we should strive more and more for that mindset. We should look for ways to humble ourselves. Peter says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Ladies, you have two choices. You can humble yourself and watch him exalt you or you can exalt yourself and say, no, God, I'm not going to do that. Watch him humble you. And that's not fun. I've, I've been in that place. That is not fun. So we see the depth of our Lord's humility and relationship to God in verse 5 and 6. How is it manifested? By letting go of his equality with God to become a man. And we see the depth of Christ's humility as seen in his relationship to man in verse 7 and 8. How was that manifested? By letting go of everything that was rightfully his to die for sinners. Ladies, this type of humility that we see exhibited in Christ cost a great price. No wonder Paul begins this passage by saying, we are to have the same mindset of Christ. And since that is true, I want to ask you, has your humility cost you anything? Is humility a virtue that you possess? Your salvation cost Christ's death on a cross. Would you humble yourself and become obedient to the Lord in your marriage, especially as it relates to submission to your husband? Will you humble yourself by submitting to the government, church leadership, your employer? Jesus was submissive to the Father. He did not consider his obedience to his Father as something degrading. Would you humble yourself and become obedient by forgiving that person that has wronged you? Jesus did. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Will you humble yourself and become obedient by thinking of others more important than yourself? Jesus did. His whole life was for the benefit of others, and he ended up giving up his life for the benefit of others. Will you humble yourself and become obedient to him by dying to yourself in whatever God is asking you to do? One of my favorite hymn writers, Francis Havergal, who wrote my favorite hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, also wrote another hymn, I Gave My Life for Thee. It was very interesting. It was in 1858. She was very tired, very weary. And she sat down, and she wrote the words of this hymn, and she threw it in the fire because she didn't like it. (laughs) And miraculously, it came out not singed at all. Her father picked it up and eventually wrote a tune to I Gave My Life for Thee. And in closing, I just want to read a couple of these stanzas. Go so well with what we've been studying this morning. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and raised up from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what have you given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee, What have you given for me? My father's house of light, my glory circled throne. I left for earthly night for wandering sad and lone. I left, I left it all for thee. What have you left for me? I left, I left it all for thee. What have you left for me? I suffered much for thee, more than my tongue can tell, of bitterest agony to rescue you from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What have you borne for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for you. What have you borne for me? And I have brought to thee down from my home above, salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What have you brought to me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What have you brought for thee? And I want to close with our response back. Oh, let my life be given, my years for thee be spent. 
World fetters all be riven, and joy with suffering blent. Thou gavest thyself for me, I give myself to thee. Thou gavest thyself for me, I give myself to thee. <laughs> 